Toledo, we're famous for Glass, Art Tatum, Tony Pacos, Jamie Farr, a world-class museum with Toledo mud hens and wildlife, an outstanding zoo and public library system. But who are the people that make our city so great? Welcome to the Soul of the Glass City podcast. I'm your host, Monique. Welcome, everyone. We're here with my special guest, Madam Senator <laughs> Paula Hicks Hudson, the myth and the legend. Oh, my God. Okay? Like, I'm your biggest fan. You just don't know it. Well, thank you for that. But I'm neither myth nor legend. I'm just me. <laughs> So we, I mean, this is amazing. Like we, we've had a history. We, we, you know, you've watched me grow up. Yep. So, you know, I was just a little girl trying to do fashion shows and writing articles. Yep. And then I'm watching you go from law to politics to becoming our 63rd mayor, first African-American female mayor of the city of Toledo. Mm -hmm. I mean, your story and your um, list of accomplishments are so long. <laughs> we don't even have enough time for that interview. We don't. That's okay. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. So are you originally from Toledo? I, you know, because I don't know that. Even though I've known you a while, mm -hmm. I don't know that. No, I'm a transplant, but I tell everyone that I we've lived here so long, or I've lived here so long, that this is home. I was born in Hamilton, Ohio, which is a city northwest of Cincinnati. I don't know nothing about Hamilton, so tell me <laughs> what makes Hamilton Hamilton. Oh, well, Hamilton is... To me, it's like a microcosm of Toledo, where you have neighborhoods and you have a community. When I grew up um, many years ago, it was somewhat segregated. There were certain parts of, we had wards where you could live in, meaning African Americans could live in. Now that's changed. We had two public high schools and then a third Catholic school. Really, uh, football was, you know, like the all that they talk about in the South, Texas, or Friday night fights or something. That was, for us, football was a major part of my life growing up. My brother played football and things like that. So Hamilton was home of champion paper. I think it was Dayton safety, uh, the safes and things like that. So our Mosler safes were, were, were built in Hamilton when I was a little kid. That is a lot of unknown history to mm -hmm. me, and I'm sure a lot of other people. So how did your upbringing, you know, inspire who you are today? Well, I grew up, I'm the youngest of eight you can call it a blended family. That's what they call them now. But I had, and my oldest brother uh, was 16 years older than me. Uh, my parents uh, had a dry cleaners, plus my dad worked for the city of Hamilton. My mom worked for um, the Hamilton Public Schools uh, later on. And so I just grew up in a, in a community where we were all given task to do and when we were when I was a little my job was to get good grades in school and then when not in school to work in the store and we were just taught you know to give back to the community because the community was was able as my dad said would put food on the table and the things that you got it's because the people in the, in the neighborhood you know they support us and things like that it sounds like a fun like fulfilling childhood <laughs> I think it was, when I say fulfilling, I think it, you know, it was what was expected of us. And it wasn't just me. It was other uh, kids in their neighborhood where we were all expected to get good grades, um, do more. And we were really encouraged by the adults. Like my dad, he came from um, uh, Georgia, uh, near Plains, Georgia, growing, and he left the South. Uh, he was supposed to go to Fort Valley to high school, and he took the money and came north because at that time it was part of the Great Migration. And he first went to Cincinnati, then settled in Hamilton. My mom was raised in Bethel, Ohio, which is a farming community west, I mean, sorry, east of Cincinnati, the only black family in that county. And when she graduated from high school, came to the city, Cincinnati, to work, and they, they met up and got married and moved to Hamilton. So, I mean, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, that was a different time than it is today, but it was about community and it was an you know we were expected to to be successful I don't know if I'm successful or not I just know that oh my goodness and what I mean by success it's about you know 
for me, my life has been about there's an opportunity. Why not? And I was blessed because my husband never said to me, oh, I don't think you should do that. He was very comfortable in who he was as a man to say, oh, if that's what you want to do, as long as it doesn't impact our children, go for it. So based on everything you told me about your upbringing and childhood, guess mm-hmm. what? What? I guess I can guess where your passion from advocacy came from, but I would like to hear from you. <laughs> well, well, I was always told, well, I loved Perry Mason growing up. So all of those kinds of shows I watched. But also you have to remember that I grew up during the time of the civil rights and voting rights era, Vietnam, and those kinds of things. And those things were very uh, in the forefront of a lot of the issues that were talked about in you know my parents' store because folks would come in after work, they would hang out with my dad, and they would talk politics, and they would talk about the world and what was right, what was wrong with the world, what should be better about the world. And we were, me, and I guess because I'm the youngest, I'm sitting around listening, and it just was ingrained to us in in me that if something is wrong, you've got to do your best to right it. And that's kind of where I come from. It's ingrained in you. I think it is. I really do. I think you're right. Because that's what I heard. You know, when I think about, there's a story I tell about when we would go to Georgia every summer. And so we would leave early in the morning. My dad would come in from work. He'd lay down for a few hours. We would be leaving Hamilton around 2 o'clock in the morning so that we could get to Atlanta before dark. And we couldn't drive. We didn't travel from Atlanta to South Georgia after dark because at that time with with Ohio plates, you know, could you know, we could have been considered as those uh, northern uh, carpetbaggers coming in to stir up our people. And so it was very I remember those those times about one time we went to visit my grandparents and we couldn't go out and play because and they put put the cars in the in the barn so folks wouldn't know that some folks from Ohio had come down to visit and all of the relatives would come to my grandparents house those were you know those were things didn't know what was going on cuz I was a little kid but you hear those stories and then now I look back on them and I think you're right it was ingrained about justice and about fairness and about opportunities for people that should not be um, slighted or stopped or stunted because either you're female or you're African-American or you're Hispanic or you're gay or whatever, that everyone it has something to contribute. And so, yeah, that's me, I think. Oh, it's definitely you. <laughs> definitely you. I mean, I'm just sitting here in awe with wide eyes, like, I want to hear more. <laughs> so you are a proud HBCU graduate. Yes. Spellman. Yep. Spelman Shout out College. to that. My mm-hmm. sister's graduated from there as well. Summa cum laude, I think. You are also the associate director of the Upward Bound Program at Central State University. Mm-hmm. Tell us how it is being HBCU alumni, who is also, I guess, working with the high school students to, you know, go to college sure. as well. Well, it, this is a funny story because um, when I was I was looking at schools, my brother wanted me to to come east where he was to school, and my sister was at Spelman, and that's again coming from Georgia. My dad was like, "You're going to go to Spelman and come by hook or by crook. We're <laughs> going to make that happen." And I believe that it really prepared me for this world because. One of the things that you don't have an excuse about being at Spelman is that you've got guys in the classroom. Well, there were there were we had uh, students from Morehouse in the classroom and we I took classes at Morehouse as well as at Spelman and at Clark. And I don't think I ever took any classes at Morris Brown because that was the Atlanta Center. But what you got there was this. There was not that. Well, is it because. I'm black or I'm female that I've got this grade. It really is about my ability or not or and and the other thing I think was that there was an expectation, an expectation that you're going to do your best. I I don't know if you've heard of the thing about the talented 10th. Well that was a that was one of the things that W.B. Du Bois talked about for African Americans that there needed to be a group of African Americans that would work with the 90% that may not get to college or may not get that extra kind of of education and so it was ingrained in us that we have to again 
help community, help others, you know, lift as you climb. That might be the reason why one of my sisters is a educator in Baltimore right now mm-hmm. with little children mm-hmm. in elementary school. And then my other sister is a librarian. Yes. So that might explain that. And I'm going to ask them about that when I am done with this interview, too, because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get to d- experience that. But I'm sure it was amazing. It is because it's, you know, you're, you know, there's an orientation and so that orientation, I can tell now that I am what's considered a golden girl. So I've been out of school from Spelman 50 years. I can't believe it. So as a golden girl, we went to our reunion, and we all of us are talking about how we're seeing the other classes sound like, act like, think like, talk like we we did. And it and I think it even go it went down to those that just graduated. So while there might be changes at Spelman when I was there, there was no sororities on campus because we were that sorority, that sisterhood. And even with the sororities still on campus now or now, it's still that sisterhood. Though you can sell a, another Spelmanite just by the way they walk, by the way they carry themselves. I'm like sitting here like I wanted to go to HBCU Mm -hmm. and then I went the family route. So now I'm thinking like, I don't care how old I get. I don't care how many kids I have. I'm going to go at some point because, you know, they have daycares. I went on a tour with some Mm -hmm. students from uh, different high schools here when we when I did the black college tour. And I was I, I was like, this is what I was missing. This is it. And they were like, you know, if you want to come back, kids or not, we have daycares on campus. Yes. And I'm like, yeah, I might have to look into that. Or I have the pleasure of having teenagers and I'm going to go take them to see if that might be an experience that they would like to, you know, do because Mm -hmm. I didn't get that opportunity yet. I'm going to say yet. (laughs) And and that's the thing. They're they're always and and that's that's if you want to say anything about who I am, it is that I dwell in possibilities. I had a good friend and she we talked about it. So what's possible? If you have life, everything's possible. It may be hard, it may be a challenge, but it's possible. I if do believe you, that. Yep. Yeah, so dwell in possibilities. And and if you're and if one of the possibilities is for you to go to HBCU. Let's make it happen. If you believe, you'll achieve. Huh? Absolutely. So that leads me to my next question. <laughs> if you could talk to your younger self, I know this is so cliche, but I had to ask. If you could talk to your younger self, what would this Paula say to younger Paula that is now into politics? As I said before, the mm. first African-American female mayor of Toledo and an Ohio state senator. What would you say to your younger self? I think I would just say, wow, because, but I I found a pic, my sister sent me a picture of me as a little girl with her and my brother, my parents, and my sister-in-law and my nephew. And there's a picture, and my sister, who um, I I love her dearly, but she is just 180 degrees different from me because she's very prim and she's very proper. And I was just, I'm a tomboy. I didn't realize I was such a tomboy until I see this picture. But I think more than anything else I would say to myself if I were to look back was that, you know, I always was the adventurer and um, I still want to be like that. I want to still have that spark. So, see, I'm look, you know, you look at to tell me tell of the younger person. I turn it around and I want that younger person to remind me of, of who I was when I was that age and that it was OK. It's okay to be, you know, scrappy and, and not fit the mold. That's that tough woman we see in front of us today. <laughs> what do you mean? That fought against all types of adversity and, uh, you know, with the big boys in the Senate, you know, like that's that's why you are here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> so what would you tell the men and women who are living in Toledo now looking for inspiration within their careers, their life? The next step, like if you could tell them anything, what would you want to say? Stop listening to this mantra about what Toledo is not and what Toledo doesn't have. Stop it. This is my husband moved here. We moved here and we always said, well, we were not going to stay here after the kids got, you know, grew grew up and everything. And my husband came home from work one day and he says, do you know all of the things that are happening in the city. And that's even before I got on the elected side of politics. I, you know, I worked, you know, as a prosecutor and I worked, you know, in government all that time. But he says, do, does, do people really see all of the wonderful things here that and the opportunities here? We are a 
medium-sized city, close to a big city. We have problems, no questions about it, but we don't have the challenges that Detroit has. We don't have the challenges that Columbus has. A lot of people say, oh, I'm going to move to Columbus. Columbus is <laughs> compared to the variety, to all of the things that we have here, and we don't appreciate it. You know, we, we are the worst critics of Toledo. And I I can't imagine from Symphony, from, you know, we Art Tatum. And there are more Art Tatums in this town than people imagine or even realize. Ramona Collins, more there are hundreds of Ramonas in this town, but we don't celebrate them. There are so there's so much talent, so much wealth here. So that's what I would tell the young men and young women in this town is that look around you and see what gifts you have and what you're able to bring to the table. And don't take it and go someplace else. I hear you. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure after this wonderful interview that they're going to hear you too. I am so honored and blessed to have you in my life and it's I'm sure pleasure. a lot of people feel the same way I know you are a great wife a great mother outside of just being a great person period so I am thankful that you took time out of your day out of your Columbus office to come here <laughs> and just bless my show thank you so much thank you so much thank you everyone for listening I'm your host and producer Monique my executive producer is Chris Piper. Join me next time for another exciting episode of Soul of the Glass City podcast. For more information, if you have questions or comments, go to wgte.org slash soul. WGTE. Voices around us. WGTE is supported in part by the American Rescue Plan Act funds allocated by the City of Toledo and the Lucas County Commissioners and administered by the Arts Commission.